Being able to have children is seen not only as a blessing, but almost as a right. But what happens if we are dealt with the harsh reality that we may be infertile? And what are the options out there in dealing with infertility? Join us for this discussion on today's Women's AM. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Women's AM. We hope that you're all in the best of Iman and are ready for another episode full of banter, news and discussion with our sisters on the panel. In our main discussion today, we look at dealing with infertility. Who is affected by this? Is it solely a female issue? And what options are there for those facing this reality? Don't miss out on the answers to these questions. Also, let me not waste any more time. We have a wonderful panel of sisters this morning. I'm Ayan and joining me, we have Sister Liz, who is a mother and a homeschooler. And two special guests this morning, we have Sister Habiba Hassan, who is a teacher, and Dr. Dia Prowesti, a gynecologist and obstetrician. Assalamu alaikum, sisters. Wa alaikum salam. How are you all doing this morning? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. You know, I was, uh, as I was coming in this morning, I was just thinking, subhanAllah, it is so wet and it's so gloomy. And then I thought, do you know what? we should count our blessings because looking at the news um, with the storm that's hit um, areas in Cumbria and Lancashire you, you think subhanAllah I'm very very lucky but you know on a positive note there was this uh, woman who I read about her name is uh, Kate Kerry Ann Graham and she set up a Facebook page um, after the storm had hit on Saturday uh, basically wanting to connect people who needed help with those who could help and then since then she's had a, a boom in followers she's got 11,000 followers and wow. people as far as London and Belfast and Wales who've been wanting to volunteer and I just thought subhanAllah it's really wonderful to see such uh, you know uh, altruism and such uh, you know humanity I think because we forget we yeah. forget that nowadays yeah. isn't it yeah. Yeah. I think these um, kind of of current atmosphere these days you know with all this terrorism issue and everything I think when we go back and look at ourselves we always find that deep inside we've got those humanity type of things that yeah. deep inside that we want to kind of be useful and be very kind and helpful to you know to, to other human fellows on yeah. uh, the earth so I think it's mashallah Absolutely, because mm. we tend to forget that, you know, with everything that goes around, there's still positivity in the world. Yeah, it's true. And I think it's nice to, when we see something so negative, like these floods. And I mean, when I was reading the stories, I just kept thinking, oh my gosh, you know, how would I feel if I couldn't go back to my house? Mm. You know, some people are going to lose, you know, so much of their possessions. And it did make me think about the way that we live life. And obviously the hadith of um, we should be living life as a traveler and we shouldn't get too attached to these things. And, you know, it's a reminder for us about that as well, isn't it? Yeah. That's amazing. My heart goes to these people and I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for them mm -hmm. but uh, what you just said shows like you know the impact that you can have the small gesture can have such a big impact yeah. and that sense of community that you will feel that yeah. although you might have lost you know something you still think oh you know this, it gives you that little bit it helps you yeah. emotionally it your yeah in human kindness so as well, doesn't it? It? Yeah. absolutely so you know in 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 like the midst of, of a disaster you get all of this uh, positivity so mashallah yeah. it's good to see this display and I hope that we can see more of this without disaster <laughs> ensuing inshallah <laughs> It is now time to discuss this morning's stories in News Bites. So Liz, I believe you've got the article for us this morning. Yeah, we've got a really interesting article this morning, actually. The title uh, reads, Want a new perspective on life? Throw out your mirror. And this is from The Guardian. Um, and it, the, the writer of this article was basically um, recounting two occasions where she was left, um, you know, without a mirror, shock horror. Um, one of them was when she was trekking uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, and another one was when she unfortunately was uh, had quite a bad jellyfish sting uh, while she was swimming in Italy. Um, and her friend felt it kind not to give her the mirror while she was in the initial stages of, you know, puffy facedness and, and pain and everything following the, the jellyfish sting. But um, basically what she's saying in the article is how does this change our perception of ourselves? How does it change our perceptions of life? Um, and she's kind of saying it actually has a bit of a positive uh, effect um, on, on how we view things and how we, uh, you know, how we basically live our lives. And it got me thinking about my relationship with mirrors. <laughs> um, and, and I think actually I 
can see that it would be quite a liberating experience. Um, I think in my life I can probably relate to one occasion when I've not had kind of regular access to a mirror um, and that was actually when I was in Aceh in Indonesia um, and they just don't have mirrors you know you go into the bathroom you go into the bedrooms and they just don't seem to have mirrors anywhere um, so you know th and that was quite a funny experience and it made me think a lot about you know why I use them and what am I trying to get out of it and that kind of thing so yeah, I can really relate to a lot of what she's I, I, quite, I quite like this article in that, um, you know, even the other incident where she talked about the first incident where she didn't have her mirror, it was when she was uh, doing a trek up Mount Kilimanjaro. Yeah. And she said that because she wasn't constantly checking to see that she was presentable or, you know, look good to her own standards, yeah. that she could actually um, focus on the things that were going on around her, the beauty that was surrounding her and actually connecting with the people that she was doing the trek with. Yeah. And then, you know, it kind of uh, made me think about my own experiences where I'm not somebody who wears makeup but I'll put it on an occasion say for example I'm going to a wedding or there's a get-together and things like that and even then I feel so stressed when I've got makeup on because I feel like I constantly have to check myself to see that something hasn't smudged or anything yeah. like that yeah. I think subhanAllah I'm so glad I don't have to wear makeup every day or I don't feel that I have to wear makeup every mm -hmm. day because I can't deal with having to check myself all of yeah. the time <laughs> yeah. absolutely so I think uh, this is kind of my personal experience as well I don't have the luxury you know to kind of yeah. check everything like my hijab and everything yeah. but I get used to kind of before you know be on a normal daily life what I used to do because I've got you know two children as well so in the morning I would spend like probably less than a minute just to put my hijab on and then I don't have the luxury to just check on the mirror and everything and it's kind of something that makes me realize that although I'm as a you know I'm a Muslim as, a, as a person but then I would like to like other people to then judge me not based on my kind of um, on the appearance yeah. so that yeah. it's just me that is you know important and valuable these you know kind of our appearance is just you know just the skin yeah. you know you need to kind of look at me That's as right. who I am yeah Listen Alhamdulillah it. and Sister Habiba I know that you don't have this issue <laughs> <laughs> what did you make of the article well, what I found very interesting was that this actually reminded me of the importance of inner self-reflection yeah. so you know yeah. nowadays self-obsession has become like a full-time job to be honest yes, you know true. it takes so much time takes yeah. so much energy like you said as well you know it gives you that is it still there is it not still there so once you this article proves that once you put all of that to the side you know um, stop focusing on yourself so much it will give you that enough time to be able to at least enjoy your surroundings yes, and yeah. be able to focus on other things that are important yeah. you know? exactly so, for example when she was uh, up the mountain she was able to see the beauty that was around her see all yeah. of those things and it's very very difficult when you just self absorb and just focusing on how do I look? Am I, how am I being judged? Mm. What's going to happen? So. Maybe we should start up a challenge then. Yeah. Don't use the mirror for a week and, and see, see how you feel about <laughs> it by week? the end of I it. I say a day. Oh, oh, a day. Oh, sorry. Was that too much? <laughs> yes, you just break me gently. sisters. <laughs> <laughs> well, in other news, in the UAE, the traditional abaya becomes a fashion statement. Take a look at this clip to find out more. Her objective, to transform the appearance of women in the United Arab Emirates. The abaya, a traditional and religious dress worn in the Gulf region, is now becoming a fashion statement. Emirati women have changed. They no longer just stay at home and only look after the children. Emirati women today have their place in society. So they need appropriate and colourful abayas, as well as comfortable designs for all situations. The abaya started out as a large black square fabric covering the entire body. The use of different shapes, fabrics and models is now modernizing this once traditional piece of clothing. Her self designs are now primed to go beyond UAE borders. As expats go home, they're likely to bring her colorful abayas back with them. Well, that's an interesting clip. I think the lady who was wearing the white abaya kind of made me uh, remember sort of the old fashion of, uh, you know, the uh, dress coats. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. what do you make of this? Do you feel that it's a, it's a positive move to have it not just as a cultural and religious thing, but to have it as more of a fashion sort of statement? I, I mean, I feel like I, we live now in a day of age where, you know, there's a constant pressure and we are constantly judged by how we look or how we dress so all the you know everybody gets pressured into trying to bring out the individuality or independence through the way that they dress but i think although some of them look really really pretty and everything we need to remember that 
an abaya is a form of hijab, you know, and a hijab is there in order to protect women. So we need to remember, does it, by, you know, the way it looks, how nice it looks, or does it actually contradict the whole purpose? of the abaya yeah I mean, I mean yeah I mean I understand your point and that you know um, the covering ourselves the hijab is an obligation from Allah mm -hmm. but at the same time we know that we have certain uh, uh, things that we can do in terms of actually making ourselves feel good in wearing the hijab I think sometimes it might be difficult for some especially when they first start covering mm -hmm. to actually wear the hijab because they think well it's just all black and yeah. you know I don't feel I look good in this I mean Liz how was your experience see, see I can I can relate exactly to what you're saying and I think alhamdulillah Allah so merciful that we do have freedom within uh, you know our dress codes our you know hijab and jubab you know our modest wear um, how, how we can interpret that in terms of color and certain styles and fabrics and that kind of thing obviously it has to adhere to the rulings of, of hijab mm -hmm. um, you know and that it can't be see-through um, you know etc etc it can't be loose yeah. fitting etc um, but but I think as well you you you, you do want some of that individuality as well. I know what you're saying, mm. that it shouldn't be the purpose for which you wear it, yeah. but I think to be able to have some of that, I think it is important. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows us better than anyone, and that's why we've been able to have this freedom within our dress code. I mean, it's 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 an interesting clip, and I think this is something that you see this phenomenon growing about, you know, hijab and all sorts of uh, Islamic dress becoming more of a fashion statement. I think yeah. in yeah. Malaysia and Indonesia, exactly. it's a very huge trend, isn't it? Is. It? Yeah. it is, and then I kind of recently, when we kind of more, you know, more kind of all this fashion, you know, about hijab and everything has developed this far, and I kind of noticed that, you know, some of my friends and colleagues and previously who kind of looked at hijab as something that is kind of old fashioned and everything, once we've got all this fashion available, they kind of start to look and then they start to kind of wear them, exactly. which is in a positive way. Yeah. I kind of, you know, kind of accept that as something yeah. in a positive way. So. Yeah, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, it changes, I suppose, for especially for people who maybe wasn't covering before oh, for yeah, young girls. Exactly. It kind of makes them feel like, actually, yeah, this is, this can be for me. For exactly. Them, yeah. So, yeah, alhamdulillah, I think there's a lot of things that we can kind of weigh up here, the pros and cons, and yeah. definitely I think it comes back to our intention and also, you know, making sure, like you've mentioned, adhering to the rulings of what consists of her job. So, yeah. alhamdulillah, room for manoeuvre. Yeah. <laughs> definitely not a bad thing, but yeah, jazakumullah khair for your, for your take on that, sisters. Well, we'll see you in just a few minutes for our main segment today in her views where we are be, uh, where we will be discussing dealing with infertility but before we go do take a look at this quick clip to find out the power of dua see you in a few minutes assalamu alaikum <laughs> Making dua isn't something we should limit to when finishing our salah, but it should be something we incorporate in every aspect of our lives. Dua has a power of changing what has already been written for you. It has been narrated by Salman al-Farsi. The Prophet said, Dua turns away destiny and good deeds lengthen age. And we should look to making dua not just in our difficult moments, but also in the moments of ease and happiness to show Allah our gratitude for his blessings. Having the utmost faith and conviction that Allah will respond is also vital to making dua. The Prophet said, when any one of you does dua, then don't say, O oh Allah, forgive me if you want, have mercy on me if you want, give me substance if you wish. Rather believe completely that he will do whatever he wishes. Nobody can force him. Be hopeful of Allah's mercy always. I'm pleased to be joined today by Minister M. A. Manon, MP, who is the Bangladesh Honourable State Minister of Finance and the Minister, State Minister of Planning. That these courts were 
anything but free and fair. I failed to follow international standards. Some of these claims are just spurious, some not frivolous in a sense. If you say I have 2,000 witnesses to, uh, to bring in, the courts have a right, they can choose among the 2,000, they say we don't have the time, which is the first 20 or first 30 or first 50. These are not matters for us, prosecution. Clearly, I was so scared and so cold as I didn't think I was going to make it through the night. I shouldn't have made it through the night, but I did. Thanks to Reed Foundation, we survived last winter, but will we survive this winter? Give an orphan child a warmer winter by donating £30. Readfoundation.org.uk Paradise lies at the feet of mothers. Islam teaches us to honour our mothers, for they hold a high status, deserving utmost respect and dignity. Becoming a mother is indeed an earnest desire and wish for any woman. But in many parts of the world, due to lack of medical facilities, mothers are deprived of fulfilling this wish. Muslim charity and its assisted hospitals around the world are striving to enable mothers fulfil their wish. Your £10 a month is a lifeline for mothers and newborn babies, ensuring they get a start in life they truly deserve. Give £10 a month and be a lifeline 0207100 or visit muslimcharity.org.uk Muslim Charity, honouring our mothers. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. You've just tuned into Women's AM. And this morning I am joined by Sister Liz, Sister Habiba, and Sister Dia Prowesti. And Sister Masha Allah, we have you here with us, a doctor, a gynecologist, and obstetrician. Thank you. Thank you for uh, me. Oh, well, don't thank us. We're, we're here for your expertise, alhamdulillah. Oh, so, in light of the fact that we're talking about infertility today, mm -hmm. what have you come across in your experience as a doctor? Yeah, so um, basically, um, I've been working in um, the field of obstetric and gynecology for quite some time now and I've come across that infertility is one of the subjects that kind of um, one of my interests so far. So I've done some research and work in the infer uh, infertility field as well. And um, one of the things that kind of um, interests me would be uh, one of the research that I had done before um, back home in Indonesia is about how women kind of cope with the stress of infertility, yeah. investigation and workup that they need to go through and then how it impacts the whole kind of process and the um, end results as well. So it's quite interesting to see how it relates to each other as well. Because physically it's not it's not just physically stressful, it's also no. very emotionally stressful it which has very very emotional physically. Exactly. And I think I think um, from certain kind of cultures, you know, having children is something that is very sensitive as well. It's not about kind of only about, you know, the couple itself, but it's kind of involving the whole big family as well. And then it kind of put pressure on the on the couple as well. And then kind of, you know. Absolutely, which yeah. is something that we see quite often, I think, especially yes, within exactly. the Muslim community. So exactly. inshallah, we'll be uh, delving more into some of these uh, themes inshallah in the discussion. Sure, Jazakallah inshallah. khair, sister. Well, without further ado, let's get on with today's discussion and her views where we discuss dealing with infertility. It is in the human nature to desire something that not even money can buy when it, become, when it comes to being blessed with a baby. But not being able to conceive is obviously a burdensome trial given to certain men and women. But those who remain patient and steadfast in faith will be successful. And indeed Allah is with those who are patient. As always, this is a live discussion, so please do share your comments and questions on this topic of infertility. The number to call is on your screen now, or you can tweet us at Islam channel hashtag WAM15. So, um, Dr. D, I'm going to come to you first. Sure. Um, when we talk about infertility mm -hmm. and the facts and figures that t t tell us about infertile mm -hmm. couples in the UK, mm -hmm. what do we actually mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, basically, we've got kind of 
define what we call as an infertility so currently we use like the definition for infertility would be if a couple had already done kind of like um, regular sexual intercourse unprotected for the whole year and um, they're not successful in being conceived so we call it infertility obviously we've got um, kind of the research showed that basically for the general population about 80 percent should be able to achieve conception within a year the rest 20 percent they've said that if we kind of waited for another year then 90 percent will then achieve conception as well then the rest 10 percent would then need some sort of help in achieving conception I so, think that's not something we tend to think about I think sometimes you don't know how much of a time frame you need to put on that yeah. before you need to consider other options so it's good to exactly. know that normally according yeah. to what it is it's a year a year and then yeah and then what we call as a regular would be like every two to three days because that research show that uh, by having intercourse like every two to three days um, unprotected regular then that it would that would give the best kind of uh, so with the increased chance, possibility of exactly to achieve conception okay mm. so when we talk about what causes infertility and the treatments available mm -hmm. what can we say are some of the uh, the causes that we may find yeah so basically um, in general we would kind of um, classify the cause of infertility to be female and male infertility obviously with the male obviously the sperm quality is one of the most important thing minor some of them which is probably only minority probably will be related to kind of some um, ejaculation dysfunction but that's only minority um, with regards to the female infertility there are uh, like certain um, classification that we normally use the first would be the ability of the woman itself to produce the oocyte or the egg so basically whether someone uh, a woman is ovulating like regularly each month so one of the things that we can kind of assess like um, pretty easily uh, is to look at her uh, period whether um, a woman is having like normal regular period and be by having a regular period we, we can kind of say in general that she should kind of producing good oocyte the other would be the fallopian tube because obviously this conception happen in these fallopian tubes any blockage any problems you know if someone has got surgery um, on the tube say for example an ectopic pregnancy any tubal ligation then it would render them from um, conceiving the other would be uh, the uh, uterus or the womb itself any condition that my kind of um, suffered by women say for example a fibroid or endometriosis then it might prevent someone to conceive as well the other would be like the general health of someone like certain medical problems as in diabetes thyroid problems um, overweight um, which leads to polycystic ovarian syndrome all of these may then contribute to problems so all in all we always say that female infertility um, causes um, kind of dominates the problems but in fact male factors is very significant as well it contribute it varies the numbers would vary from 25 to 35 percent so it is very significant and then when dealing with the infertility we can't only look to you know one partner we have to look at the couple and then kind of try to identify where it is problem and then doing all this investigation sometimes put a lot of stress because then because it's very thorough and it's very, very um, thorough very personal as well exactly and sometimes you know one of them if we if we do then find because 25 percent of infertility we couldn't find the cause means unexplained but then if we can then sometimes you know one of the side will then feel guilty and then it's very difficult to kind of explain that it's not kind of something that you need to kind of feel guilty about it we need to i think that's one thing that we forget sometimes we think that if something is unexplained mm. then you know oh my goodness ha that's terrible what am i going to do how am i going to explain this and sometimes it comes back to us having that patience and that trust in a lot as well so i think that's it, that's a very Absolutely. very good reminder when you are you're in that situation Absolutely. Um, but when we look at the treatments available sister habiba what kind of treatments can we find um, to help with uh, infertility help against infertility alhamdulillah there are many treatments that are you know available out there and like the sister said you know all of those are from the medical aspects but sometimes 
even lifestyle choices that you make can have that big impact. For example, so, um, there are some people who are such career orientated, which is no problem, but they make a conscious choice of having a child, you know, delay having children. And obviously, as we know, evidently, you know, age is a big, it has a big, a big impact on, you know, having a baby. And the stress as and, well. Yeah, and it's stress. a stressful job and, you know, you've kind of got that mindset that can also have a big effect as well. Yeah. And yeah. you also have that pressure from family mm. and, you know, yeah. friends and everybody are constantly asking. So all yeah. of those things can cause and lead to that stress. And some of the, you know, medicines or treatments that are available are, um, fertility medical treatments which involve um, fertility medications which help the process along and also there could be surgical you know procedures that might have to be done for such cases of endometriosis as well sometimes you might need to take yeah, it to that absolutely. Yeah. and have a surgery procedure and after if all of the medical treatments do fail there's also the option of assisted reproductive technology techniques such as IVF that's mm -hmm. out there so there are lots of treatments that are available but obviously it will depend on the course and this depends on on the couple uh, on and the depending couple, on what, yeah. what they what actually what need. So it's about exactly. tailoring what they need. Uh, yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you would tailor these uh, treatments and these sort of treatments that we can look yeah. into? So basically what we normally do, um, if someone uh, normally in like NHS setting, then the, the GP would normally like the first contact of, um, of a point when a couple then feels that they kind of having problems in um, conceiving. So normally the GP would then kind of do like the initial investigation that would involve blood tests and then um, some of them would like need to kind of have a thorough history. Is there any kind of any predisposing factor that might kind of lead a woman or a man to have infertility? Say for example if someone has got long-standing history of polycystic ovarian syndrome or long-standing history of endometriosis then yes that's probably one of the cause then uh, normally GP would then refer them to the um, fertility specialist in hospital to have all this investigation so it would include like tubal um, patency investigation we can, we normally do what we call as a hysteroscopy and then we check the hormones level making sure that some a woman is kind of ovulating each month and then we also need a sperm analysis from a man um, and then all after all this investigation we kind of then try to point out what is the problems and then we kind of you, you will know, go from it. there exactly to to exactly the so majority of the women um, with the um, ovulation disorder will then need to have kind of treatment initially just to make sure that you know the um, that she can kind of produce a good quality uh, oocytes and then you know some of them like polycystic ovarian syndrome for example it's very difficult to manage but actually doing like something simple well I'm saying it's simple I know it's not very easy but say for example majority of the polycystic ovarian syndrome they've got overweight kind of problems then research showed that by actually reducing the weight by even for like 10 percent it kind of Resume, resume the um, ovulation function, so kind of lead a healthy lifestyle is very important. How, um, what other factors can we kind of attribute to, you know, um, not being a cause, but actually um, being one of the reasons why the infertility exists? So, for example, uh, Sister Habiba talked about um, lifestyle. I mean, mm -hmm. are there other lifestyle choices besides maybe being overweight that actually contribute to into infertility? Yeah, of course. So, um, there are like certain smoking, for example. Smoking is known to kind of reduce the quality and the quantity of the sperm it also contribute to the quality of the oocyte as well so if you go for the NHS when you said that you're smoking they're not going to offer you the treatment until you stop smoking and then um, obviously this is probably not kind of applied to the Muslim but alcohol consumption is also a big problem and um, the other would be some of the kind of um, uh, occupation like for example a um, man who works in like a factory with like high heat and everything then it kind of um, reducing the numbers and quality of the sperm as well. So there are many things to consider. So it's about yes, looking not just about your physical health, but even your the environment that the you're environment in. You're yes, in. Yeah. So there are a lot of things to think Lots about. Things, and inshallah, exactly. we'll be coming back to the rest of this discussion, inshallah. Uh, we do have to go to a, a quick break, but don't go far, because when we return, we'll be continuing with this topic. And before we go, take a look at this week's competition. 
This week on Women's AM, we're holding another exciting competition. Up for Grabs is a voucher worth over £100 by online Abaya retailer, Jarab. To be in with a chance to win this fabulous prize, all you have to do is answer the following question. What is the name of Musa Ali Salam's brother? A. Abdullah B. Harun C. Yusuf D. Yunus email your answer to womensam at islamchannel.tv along with your name, address and two original topics you would like the sisters to discuss. The deadline for entries is Friday the 11th of December 2015 at 4pm. Please allow 28 days for delivery. All applicants need to be over 18 and residing in the UK. Please note only one entry per person per household. A winner will be randomly selected from all correct entries and the winner's name will be announced on Monday's show. So get entering. Study with Tayyibun Institute, the UK's leading independent Islamic institution. Three-month structured part-time courses, full-time diploma programs, structured children's madrasa. Subjects include Quran, Arabic language, and Islamic studies. For more information, please visit our website or contact us on 0207 702 7254. Ibrahim College's new term of Islamic part-time courses for adults is starting soon. We have courses to suit every seeker of knowledge. We have courses in Arabic language, Tajweed, Fiqh, Akida, Sira, Islamic history and more. Or why not join one of our special programs? Enroll online today at ibrahimcollege.org.uk Ilma is an exciting Islamic lifestyle e-magazine exploring religion, spirituality, social issues, health, culture, world cuisine and style. With a global readership of over 100,000, Ilma is now available to download as a brand new app on your tablet or smartphone. You can enjoy all this fantastic educational content from the palm of your hand. Ilma magazine brought to you by the Dawa Project, spreading Islam through digital media. For more information and advertising opportunities, please call 0207 330 1744. I'm pleased to be joined today by Minister M. A. Manon, MP, who is the Bangladesh Honourable State Minister of Finance and the Minister, State Minister of Planning. That these courts were anything but free and fair, failed to follow international standards. Some of these claims are just spurious, some not frivolous in a sense. If you say I have 2,000 witnesses to, uh, to bring in, the courts have a right, they can choose among the 2,000, they say we don't have the time, we'll see the first 20 or first 30 or first 50. These are not matters for us, prosecution.
Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Women's AM. This morning I am joined by Sister Liz, Sister Habiba and Dr. Dia. Uh, we're continuing our uh, discussion on infertility. Please do call in if you have something to share with us or have a question on this topic. The number is on your screen now or you can tweet us at his Islam channel hashtag 150. So Liz, I'm going to come to you. And a lot of the times when uh, I think it's been mentioned briefly that uh, sometimes age is a factor when it comes to uh, uh, fertility issues and that the longer you wait, the older you get, the less likely you are to conceive but latest data from the UK's Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority have suggested that two-thirds of women who have had IVF are actually under the age of 37 so what does that actually suggest to us? Well I think this is a really interesting question actually and in terms of um, the, the research that's gone into infertility there's so much out there and there's so many different areas that have been focused on and it's really very difficult to kind of pinpoint one thing you know like the age of a woman it's always the big mm. big story isn't it around and infertility you know like she's too old or the, you know you've waited too long or this kind of thing but um, as you've said that that doesn't kind of tell the whole story because lots of women under that age are going for the treatment I mean however age does affect you know fertility and by um, the age of 35 uh, so by the age of 40 uh, the chance of pregnancy has decreased from 90% to around 67 um, and then by 45 um, it actually declines to 15% so we can see there's quite a dramatic um, drop there in terms of um, you know being a sort of uh, uh, being able to get pregnant yeah, over that age um, but I think the interesting thing that I actually found in my research is a point that you've uh, um, made this morning as well is around the male factors there's actually a lot of new research into how big of an impact the male factors are having in, in infertility um, and I was reading an interesting article by uh, Dr. Rosemary Leonard uh, no relation to mine by the way um, <laughs> who describes um, infertility as being a rising problem um, and far from you know a few years ago we were saying you know there's going to be a population boom and and all the rest of it actually now we're kind of seeing the opposite um, and we are seeing that men are kind of their, their sort of contribution to infertility if you like that's actually on the increase um, again according to her research she's saying that male factors account for around 25 to 30 percent which is around what you said um, and that's pretty much catching up with the, the sort of female, female um, actually, yeah. um, yeah. percentage wise yeah. as well um, and then obviously the rest of it is a, is a combination of both of them or, or unknown factors mm -hmm. so I think that's quite um, you know that's quite a significant factor to remember as well we're often always talk about the woman and mm. the factors around the woman as to why she can't conceive but it's really interesting to look at the whole story but sometimes um, sort so of the things that I've been hearing and you know the certain articles that you get around celebrity culture yeah. and even people who are very career driven not that there's anything wrong with that yeah. it's that um, they all want they ha want to have a set number of children by a set number of age and they think the only way that that's going to happen so say for example I only want to have two kids and I don't want to have to go through two pregnancies um, I'm gonna go for IVF and try to have twins so I think sometimes even lifestyle choices actually can play a part in some of these numbers as well so that's just my take on it I don't know whether there's been research into that or not yeah. but uh, so I think um, I think I just put a comment on that you know kind of that kind of um, lifestyle choices. Lifestyle choices. You know, if I can go for IVF, then I can have like twin pregnancy. In fact, recently, the numbers of that multiple pregnancy and birth um, secondary to IVF had been decreased because now we kind of realize that having multiple pregnancy is classified as a high risk pregnancy, mm -hmm. not only for the mother but for the babies as well. So these days, unless we have like a very strong indication to put back the embryo or you know the the um the um, egg and sperm that has been kind of um, fertilized back to the womb unless we've got like a very good reason we normally only like put back one of them mm. and then we kind of preserve the other and then on the next cycle if the if the couple wish then we can then uh, put the rest so that's that's one thing uh, the other thing is about kind of the age of uh, the, the the women who kind of uh, have had the IVF pregnancy is below 37 and um, there are lots of research that show that basically it's not the it's not only age that then contribute to the kind of end product of IVF because we know IVF is not 
you know it's not yeah. cheap it is very expensive then um, so one of the kind of most determining factors would be what is the ovarian reserve of a woman before then she kind of undergo an IVF. So it's about preempting. So if we know that there's an existing reason for why a woman may have difficulty in conceiving at a, a later age, then obviously she would try and, and, and uh, conceive before then so that she doesn't have to deal with that issue later on. So yeah, yeah, that's that is one part. And the other part is we kind of only offer IVF, obviously because this is an expensive procedure. It comes with um, lots of side effects as well um, not only kind of short term but long term as well then we kind of select the candidate for IVF like very carefully so before a woman go for IVF procedure uh, one of the things that we kind of normally do during IVF would be what we call as a um, hyper stimulating the ovaries so that the ovaries would then produce lots of eggs in one cycle. So we normally kind of only produce one oocyte or one egg every cycle but during IVF we will then kind of hyper stimulate the ovary and before then we need to kind of find out what is the ovarian reserve of a woman so i had um i had uh, one of my research that was published in one of um the journal article it's about this ovarian reserve in in a woman then it showed that um after a certain level then the ovarian reserve would be low and the response to the ovarian stimulation would be very very low which then kind of giving the overall success of IVS, IVF as uh, really low. That's so, interesting actually because um, in America I know you hear a lot of women talking when they're in their 30s mm. even if they're not married or, or, or not with a partner they want to like freeze their eggs so that exactly. you know. Because you know by the time the woman you know it's not only the quantity of the egg that Keep yeah, it also the quality. Of quality. Yeah, yeah. So nowadays we kind of offer this treatment as well. Say for example, if a woman need to undergo chemotherapy or radiotherapy for any yeah. kind of cancer or anything, then we it's offer this kind the, of the quality. Of the eggs, exactly, it? because so, chemotherapy yeah. will then go to the ovaries and then you know kind of ruin all yeah. the oocytes. So yeah. we offer to take the you know the cell, the egg, and everything, preserve them, and then later on when they decided to kind of start the family then yeah, we can retrieve all so these so many things to th there are so many things to think about in terms of why you would go uh, for IVF because it's not just about wanting to yeah. have the child there are so many things to consider but Absolutely. when we look at um, what Islam has to say and the advice that it has to give in regards to infertility what options are there for couples sister Habiba well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's an ayah here about the Islamic advice regarding this. And Allah, in Surah Al-Ashura, Allah said He created what He wills. He bestows female offspring upon whom He wills. He, and bestows male offspring upon whom He wills. Or He bestows both male and female. And He renders barren whomever He wills. So, from this you can see that um, children in the Quran it shows that children are a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. But on the, other, on the other hand as well, in being infertile or it is another form of gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it could be a way to, you know, um, achieve that reward from Allah. So there's no specific teachings in the Quran about in infertility treatments. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did say, um, seek treatment. You know, um, in Allah lan yada'da'an illa wudalahu shifa. And Allah has not brought down any disease except that He has brought down a cure, a cure for it. So um, infertility is a form of disease yeah. or illness that affects that reproductive system. So we are encouraged and Islam encourages us to go out there and seek whatever treatment that's possible. I think because you do kind of get this tendency, I think, within the Muslim community that, you know, it's that you, you shouldn't be talking about this issue. If yeah. you do have infertility issues, you should keep it to yourself. But subhanAllah, we have, you know, Islam which teaches us to be proactive yeah, in whatever absolutely. issues we face. And I think, I think this is the reason why people find it so difficult to deal with, because you don't really have an outlet for it. Um, and actually, you know, Alhamdulillah, as we know of, of Islam, as we know of the Quran, it deals with all issues. So of course it's going to deal with infertility. It's going to give us help it's gonna you know give us that hope um, and this is what uh, Islam and, and our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all about isn't it it's about hope and having that hope and it also I think in terms of infertility infertility um, this is such a huge test it really is and I think it kind of made me think of a hadith uh, you know that I'll paraphr paraphrase uh, you know the matters of a believer are strange everything is good for them mm -hmm. so you know everything whatever you go through in your life is good for you you know if you're going through something it's from Allah and if it's from Allah it is good for you 
you. And I think it's it's a difficult one to kind of get your head round, but when you kind of take it apart, it, it's this, uh, you know, often we hear people say, I don't know if I'm being um, tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or if I'm being punished for something. Um, and, and I was listening to a talk recently and the sister said, um, actually, it doesn't matter what the test is, the the, the, the defining thing is how you respond to it. So if this thing brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it was a good thing. You know, it's, it's Allah telling you that he wants you closer to him. So this is how we should view any of these things. And obviously when we look in the Quran, you know, we have stories of infertility. You know, obviously famously we have Ibrahim alayhi salam mm. um, and Sarah. And, and it's interesting when we're talking about age as well, because obviously they were very old. Um, I mean, you know, different sources have their ages at different, uh, you know, have aged them differently. Uh, but I think... Um, uh, um, Sarah was around 90 and Ibrahim was around um, 100, you know, when she fell pregnant. So it's like Allah will bless whom he wills. And I think we shouldn't give up that hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in I think, unfortunately, we have this idea that, you know, obviously the nat natural progression is that when you get married, that you should have children. Mm. And we don't, you know, have this idea in our heads. Well, if that doesn't happen, what then... You you know, alhamdulillah anyway, because yeah. at the end of the day, I think we need to understand that we weren't created solely to be a mother or solely to be a father, but it is about worshipping Allah. You know, I came across a really lovely article, and I know we've talked about it on this show before, um, but the article is called, Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to become an Aisha and not a Khadija. And I think this is important because it's the, the whole article is kind of telling us to be happy with what Allah has ordained for us. And if Allah doesn't want us to, or if Allah is not going to, uh, you know, grant us a child or grant us a family, you know, alhamdulillah. Allah has got something better planned for us. Mm. Look at the life of Aisha radiallahu anha. She had no children, but she, without her, we wouldn't have the, the deen, we wouldn't have the knowledge of Islam that we have today. So what a, a journey she had, what a mission she had. And, and that's what we have to remind that's ourselves. That's a really good reminder, I think. And then coming now, because we're coming to the end of the show, we mm. don't miss the, want to miss the opportunity of what tips we can give to anyone who is facing infertility, Doctor. Sure. Um, then, um, so obviously the first one would be, um, you know, to being pregnant, being, con you know, having a baby and everything, it needs like a good preparation, not only physically, but as well as mentally and spiritually as well. So uh, from the medical point of view, we always say is that if you're, you know, planning a pregnancy, then, you know, get, um, get folic acid supplements, lead a, you know, good lifestyle. Um, eating healthy and all sorts of things. But most importantly, I think, you know, you need to know where you need to find a help. So if you feel that you've been having like, you know, regular intercourse for the whole year, nothing happens, then go to your GP and seek for help because time is ticking, you know, especially if your age is kind of borderline. We always say that, you know, if you're above 36 and then if you're not being, you know, having um, no pregnancy for six months, then don't wait even further go to your GP and then get yourself referred to kind of seek other help. So, so, so time is of the essence. So exactly. if you feel that something's not right, then go and see the doctor. I think that's yeah. one of the things we tend to put things off thinking. Mm, I'll just absolutely. give it a bit more time and see how it goes. So yeah. Alhamdulillah, Jazakum Allah Khair for all your points and your tips. We as Muslims are tested in many different ways, but being infertile has even affected some of the best women in Islam. It truly is a blessing as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he creates what he wills, he bestows female offspring upon whom he wills and bestows male offspring upon whom he wills or he bestows both male and females and he renders barren whoever he wills verily he is the all-knower and is able to do all things so subhanallah never lose faith in Allah and always show gratitude to the blessings he has provided this has been such an informative discussion but if you've missed any of today's show you can catch a repeat tonight at 11 p.m. or you can catch up with the highlights from this week on Sunday at 3 p.m. alternatively you can catch us on YouTube take a look at this clip to find out how did you know you can now watch some of your favourite episodes and previous clips from Women's AM online on demand? Visit youtube.com forward slash Islam Channel TV. There's a fantastic variety of clips like this one with Sister Saima and Nusrat. Keep up to date with the latest on Women's AM every day. That's youtube.com forward slash Islam Channel TV. Well, now you'll never have to miss another episode, so no excuse. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have come to the end of today's show, but do join us again tomorrow where we'll be t uh, discussing the safeguarding ourselves and our children in the current climate. But before we go, here's another reminder of this week's competition. 
Next week on Women's AM, we're holding another exciting competition. Up for Grabs is a voucher worth over £100 by online Abaya retailer, Jarab. To be in with a chance to win this fabulous prize, all you have to do is answer the following question. What is the name of Musa Ali Salam's brother? A. Abdullah B. Harun C. Yusuf D. Yunus email your answer to womensam at islamchannel.tv along with your name, address and two original topics you would like the sisters to discuss. The deadline for entries is Friday the 11th of December 2015 at 4pm. Please allow 28 days for delivery. All applicants need to be over 18 and residing in the UK. Please note only one entry per person per household. A winner will be randomly selected from all correct entries and the winner's name will be announced on Monday's show. So get entering. Welcome to all our sisters and to you viewers at home. We'll see you tomorrow, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.